We say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. And if you would, open your Bibles or turn on the Bible app on on your phone to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. That is the New Testament. Gospel of Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 12. Jesus is about to say and do something that will trigger the start of some conclusive responses about him. Both among the religious leaders and the people, as we're going to see next week, those who are in power during Jesus' time try to negotiate with them to see if there's any wiggle room there. When beyond all doubt, Jesus says his offer to rescue and run your life is an all or nothing proposition, Jesus himself tells us that their plan, the plan of the people in power, is for his murder. Because the religious leaders start to grasp that Jesus is setting himself up to replace the temple as the structure in which to house God, house the presence of God. Jesus has left no room for any other powers in Jerusalem, and so those powers seek to destroy him. But let's read together. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25. On the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy Jesus, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you curse has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. This is God's word. Your attendance this morning at Petaluma Christian Church could be your greatest enemy. Your church attendance has the potential to be the most harmful deterrent to real change in your life. Your church attendance can prove to be the most costly uh, counterfeit into which you ever invest your life. But before you hear this and think, say, thanks, Ryan, I'll just go ahead and leave now for brunch. Before you do that, please just stay a little longer and hear what Jesus says and does, because he provides one possibility for genuine change, one possibility for producing lasting impact, one possibility for a full life lived with unfettered access to the God of the universe. And we start with an incident about which Jesus comes across, frankly, as kind of like an impetuous child. (laughs) Jesus lives out the first century country boy equivalent of just that of the time Jesus gets hangry, right? He, 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 seeks, he seeks a snack, right? He seeks a snack in the form of a fig tree, and he gets mad and curses the fig tree when he finds it bare, which is, seems pretty unfair, right, to the fig tree? Because we're explicitly told it is not the season for figs. Uh, so what is Jesus expecting? But actually, in the spring months in Palestine, March through April, right before the season for figs, there were these little green knobs that were formed on the fig tree called pagim. And pagim were these delicious little, almost considered a delicacy, you would kind of pick off the fig tree and snack on for yourself. 
It was a delicacy that some people didn't know about, some did, Jesus certainly did. But when he looked at the tree, he didn't even find those pagem, those little green knobs. So noticing none of those pagem, Jesus knows something that most people don't know, and it's this, that this fig tree is never going to work like it should. It's never going to produce like it should. And wow, why is this included in the Bible? This is when we realize Jesus isn't really making a statement about a fig tree, is he? That's probably not why this is included in the Bible, is it? He's making a statement about us. Through the unfolding of two sort of object lessons, which are kind of jolting, a fig tree and a temple, Jesus makes two big statements about us. And they're not really great statements, but just when it seems all hope is literally withered to its roots, Jesus holds out one possibility for us. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Two big statements about us, one possibility for us. Statement one about us that Jesus makes here through these two object lessons. We believe we have a minor problem, so we seek out a minor solution. And the most helpful way I thought of doing this this morning was kind of use a then and now approach. We're going to talk a little bit about what was going on back then, the context of Jesus and his teaching, and then how that impacts us in life today. So first, then, most Jews believed they were born with a minor problem, and so they sought out a minor solution that they felt God provided, and that was the temple. The temple was this place where you would believe as a Jewish person, I can right the occasional wrongs I do in my life by occasionally visiting the temple and getting together with God. Taking refuge in temple attendance as an effective life strategy was for a first century Jew kind of an easy strategy to slip into. Imagine this with me, okay, if you would. You grew up hearing stories about Abraham, who we're told was a friend of God. You grew up hearing stories about Moses, who would meet with God up on a mountain. You grew up with stories about David, whose greatest solace wasn't a military victory, even peace throughout the land, but getting back to be with God in his house. And so that's one of the reasons God, David wanted to build for God an earthly home that wasn't just a tent, a tabernacle that would move from place to place, but a permanent, big, majestic structure that people could visit and meet with God whenever they wanted to. And that would be where God would really show up. And as you grew up, your parents' faith reflected this. In fact, your dad and mom's religious fervor would be peaked during the three main Jewish festivals that took place every year. Each of these festivals would last a full week, and all of it would culminate in the temple. They would center around the temple. And so you grew up traveling with your parents three times a year to Jerusalem. And as you walked up the hill towards Jerusalem, towards the temple, you'd sing a road trip playlist with all the families around you, right? You'd crank up the playlist together, and this playlist was 15 psalms in the Old Testament called the Psalms of Ascent. They were psalms about getting to go to the temple, Psalms 120 through 134, and in fact, this time last year, we were all going through the Psalms of Ascent. I was teaching through them last summer. So you walked into the temple. Finally, you got there. And as you walked into the temple, specifically, you were walking into the largest area of the temple called, it was this outer court called the Court of the Gentiles. It was the Court of the Nations, and it was alluring. Thousands of people with various cries to God in different languages, bustling with activity. Sure, as you grew up and other times of the year, you heard about the, to you, kind of distant faith remote faith of people like Abraham, Moses, and David, who you couldn't see anymore. But here before you was this temple. Face-to-face -to -face you were encountering encounter with it. Was a, it was a grand spectacle that kind of symbolized being Jewish. This is where your faith was refreshed, where you'd finally make yourself right with God. Fast forward then to minor problems and solutions now. There are, let me give you a few simple but common reasons people make the journey to church on Sunday morning. It's not quite the same pilgrimage as it was to Jerusalem for you this morning, I'm guessing, right? But, but you know, it's something. Why do we do that? One thing we say to ourselves is, well, 
at most, I mean, I need to change. You get out of bed, you go to church because you know your life is in need of a serious remodel. You've experienced significant personal problems that have hindered your job performance. It's hindered your relationships, it's hindered your marriage. It's hindered how you feel about yourself, what you think in your head, and these thoughts you never thought you'd have before, and you know you need change in your life. Some of us just feel like we need a little bit of help. We've made a few significant errors in judgment, but that's not really who we are deep down. We just need a little more help, a wisdom, some guidance in our lives, and so we head to church. Some of us just feel like we need a little pick-me-up, right? You know, I, I, I live an already good life, but I'd like to improve it. A little retouch, a little refresh here and there. But like Jesus says of the temple, church attendance in and of itself is a minor solution with no actual power to change you. And I'm saying that as a pastor. <laughs> I have everything to benefit by you being here, trust me. But he warns us that church attendance in and of itself, its end is like a fig tree, it's dead spirituality withered to its roots. In and of itself. The testimony of Jesus here is this, that you don't need a pick-me-up, you don't need help, you don't need just significant changes. You need a total rebuild to your life. And that's why he does these two kind of big object lessons. God's major solution is so radical that like God's kingdom, it can't be defined, it can only be described. It's so big. He calls it, he says we need to be a new creation. Not just a clean slate, but an entirely new slate. He says we need to be born again, not just a fresh start, but an entirely new life. He says that we need to trade this heart of stone for an entirely new heart of flesh, not just a refresh or a heartwarming moment on a Sunday morning, but an entirely new heart. And on this more malleable, tender heart, God will write his law, the right things to do that we can't do on our own. We've tried. God offers a total transformation in the ability to do it, to do the radical things that he says and be the radical change he calls us to be in the world today. Why do we need such a total change to our lives? Because we have a major problem. And that problem is called sin. Now, you may have been to church before and heard this word, but no one's actually told you what it is. It's this big hereditary no that begins in our hearts and shows up in our actions, saying no to God and yes to self. You know, people often wonder, why is the Old Testament, you know, the, the first part of the Bible, so dang long? Why couldn't Jesus have just come earlier? Why do we have to read all this stuff in the Old Testament? It's because of this. It's generations of people trying to fix fix what's broken in their lives, and they can't do it on their own. And it was like we had to see generations and centuries of evidence that even as things got a little better, they always got worse. People always stayed broken. They could never find solutions. And the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah even says, though you try as hard as you can, you'll, you'll wash, like you'll try to wash a garment, a stain out of a garment, the stain of your guilt always stays before me. Now, most of us, or a lot of us here, grew up in, a scientific, in the scientific age, and all of us are still experiencing the effects of it. Namely, what I'm talking about here is the scientific method. Who's grown up in school learning about the scientific method? Wow, a lot of you did not, and that's a real disappointment to our school system. I mean, that was, that was really under 50%. Jeez. I mean, we need, we need to revisit some things, don't we, here? Maybe we have bigger problems. All right. The scientific method, which involves the gathering of observable empirical evidence, right? You make a hypothesis, you look for more evidence then, and with that evidence you develop a theory, you test the outcomes until theory becomes fact. There is no more evidence, empirical fact in this world, than the reality of sin and our inability to eradicate it, our inability to get rid of it. Let me try to prove that to you first. 20th century was supposed to be the next age that we'd finally, as, as a people, as a human race, we matured enough to do it ourselves, to get rid of evil without religion. To get rid of evil without religion. But the most significant acts of intolerance and violence in the 20th century were practiced by those who were convinced that religion was the problem, that religion was the cause of intolerance and violence in the world. Soviet Russia eradicated 
communist China, Pol Pot's Kumar Rouge, and finally Nazi Germany, all put the kibosh on religion as their main form of ideology. And what happened through all of those regimes, right? We see this fact in, in little children who are supposedly innocent until they, until they say no and throw food back into our face. And we realize, oh, <laughs> you're not so innocent. And we don't know where that comes from. It's evidence. Evidence of the big no in your heart. We encounter it most seriously when we encounter prejudice and hate and corruption that affects the most vulnerable in our society. And we see it most personally in our own hearts. You catch yourself thinking a thought, an alarmingly wicked thought comes through your head. And you're like, where did that come from? Did it happen to you? You act on an impulse that if it was done to you, it would be deeply hurtful. You convince yourself that certain wrong doings are good, right? The ends will justify the means, and we tell ourselves this, and we justify what we do in our hearts. Here's the point for our passage. Taking refuge in charity giving and church going is not sufficient to please a perfect God, nor is it an effective mechanism for bringing about real change to our lives because of sin. It won't take care of this major problem, just coming to church on a Sunday or just being a, a giving kind of person. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's a statement about us. Statement number two he's making about us through these two object lessons of a fig tree and a temple. Calling religious rituals real religion distracts people from the right solution. Calling religious r- rituals real religion actually distracts people from the right solution. Back to then. Back to then, okay? So imagine with me, if you would, you've grown up and you've trained to be a priest in God's temple. Thankfully, it's in your blood. Life hasn't changed too much. You know, it's not perfect, but you get to see genuine joy every time these pilgrims come to the temple to make sacrifices at these festivals. One merchant, you know, sold 3,000 sheep last Passover and twice as many pigeons, And the margins are incredible, by the way, on these animals that they would sell during the highest festivals. The New York Stock Exchange floor has nothing on the temple, the Jewish temple in the first century. So you've been told the high priest actually owns a piece of the action. And you you kind of benefit from it also, and you're okay with it because everybody gets what they want. It's a win-win situation. People get to worship and please God. And uh, we earn a little bit extra on the side, you know, for our efforts as a priest. And yet, I'm noticing through all this, people I see every year, they don't seem to be changing. I haven't changed. I'm not seeing through all my justification that actually if I am changing, I'm probably, I think I'm changing for the worse because I'm kind of using money with religion, right? And I'm mixing that together. And what I really love is probably money here. Even still, I keep telling people that they can please God through their worship. When they come to these festivals and they make sacrifices, until one day this teacher named Jesus comes along, right? And his object lesson says something big about this religious ritual, that it actually is kind of impotent to cause real change. And in fact, we're not pleasing God. There's not real change. But in fact, in fact we've, we've actually made the temple a refuge from getting real change in our life, a hiding place from real change. Jesus' teaching is this, that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, which is a quote from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 56, where God promises to send salvation for all peoples. And that's anticipated here in the court of Gentiles. We looked at that earlier, right? Literally the court of nations, which should be the one place where anyone can approach God. Anyone can talk to God. Anyone can pray to God. Instead, so-called religious people had made it into, quote, a den of robbers, which is a quote from Jeremiah 7. A den of robbers. Now, whenever I've read this in the past, maybe you've heard it before, I've always focused on the robbers part. Right, but from the context of Jeremiah chapter 7 in this passage, robbers could also mean gamblers. It could be mischief makers. The emphasis in reality is on the den. It's, on the, it's, in an, it's a hiding place. It's a refuge from our real problem. And that's sometimes what we make church, right? It's sometimes what we make, it's what they made the temple back there, that actually if I just do this, 
it makes me okay, and it's a refuge from what's really going on in my life. I'm not really changing. I'm not really getting that transformation I really need. I'm just feeling better about myself. People were led to believe back then, if I just go to the temple, if I just show up to church and do my own thing, me and God are good, and I'm okay. As we relate to this now, you see what's happening, right? The the responsibility to lead others to the right solution, what is this church, is partly on you and it's partly on me, people in leadership. Let's talk about you first. (laughs) Then we'll talk about me. All right. There's an old saying. It says something like this. Share the gospel. Share the good news about Jesus. Share the gospel and when necessary, use words. And that statement is wildly misleading. Words are absolutely necessary if, if you're living a great life. You should use words when someone compliments you for being a good parent, for being an honest worker, for being a faithfully, faithful family member or a friend. If they, if they praise you for your compassion or for your wisdom or integrity, and you just take it, or, or worse, you just say, well, that's because I go to church. And you leave it there as if that ritual deserves the credit. You're leading people away from the right solution. Your church attendance doesn't make you a good person. And if you stay silent, the default conclusion will be, well, to be a good person, you just got to go to church, right? That works. That that is why Jesus is overturning the temple. (laughs) Some of that responsibility lies with me or with, with people like me in church leadership. When I hear people say they love Petaluma Christian Church, I need to continue to say to them as I remind myself, if you love PC and you see some change, some lasting change in your life, it's because you're meeting Jesus at PCC. It's not because of PCC. It's because Jesus is here. As a 22-year-old, second-year youth pastor in his church in Germany talking with teenagers, Dietrich Bonhoeffer recognized something dangerous in the church. Here's what he wrote. I'm gonna, I don't like to do quotes, but I'm going to do the full one here. He said, Christianity conceals within itself a germ hostile to the church. It is far too easy for us to base our claims to God on our Christian religiosity and our church commitment. And in doing so, we utterly misunderstand and distort the Christian idea. Let me give you the context here before I revisit this quote. German churches in the 1930s, which this is when Bonhoeffer's talking, they were spreading this uh, idea that the religious ritual of going to church and doing other religious, that was real religion. Come because you should come to church, right? Because church will help you. Because in church, you're going to find your salvation. And the church in saying these things and communicating these things, it lost its true power. So there was ripe to be replaced by the next power that culture swept along, which happened to be the Nazi party in Germany. And the church allied themselves with the Nazi party in Germany. But I love that line. I appreciate that line. Christianity can be a germ hostile to the church. I like that idea of germ because it's not fully hostile to the church. right? Jesus loves the church. He advances the church. He protects it from all manner of hell. But there's a germ. There's this dormant virus that there is some kind of power in church itself, right? And attending it and being a part of it and serving in it. But a church only has power because Jesus is present and exalted. And that's the only reason. Jesus is setting himself up as the structure of God, as the temple of God. And as such, in his person, he makes possible the presence of God for you and for me. And that opens up, finally, the possibility for us, which is trusting your life to a person, not a program, a person. I used to ask our kids when they were young, when we kind of talk about Jesus with them, and we talk about that if you want to know God forever, you got to trust Jesus. And what does that mean? I would, we would ask, like, about what would you be trusting Jesus? And we had this little saying that he's the God of the universe and your life, and the only one who could forever forgive sin. And that summarizes exactly what Jesus says after reviewing these dead-to-the-root solutions, after these object lessons. The emphasis on him, prayer moving mountains, which we hear in this passage, right, isn't on the degree of miracle achieved through prayer as much as it's on the startlingly, startling reality that the same God who withers fig trees and moves mountains would want to 
communicate and have a relationship with us, that he's personally attentive to you. At any moment, you can talk to someone who will reach out into your history and move the mountains in your life. That's amazing. At any point, you could do that. Now, the final teaching of Jesus, while important, seems kind of random and disconnected. Look at verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven can be forgive your trespasses. And that would be random if not for the lesson of the fig tree. The fig tree represents our inability to get close to God through our own efforts. Because of that deeper hereditary disease called sin, we don't really change. We don't really produce lasting fruit. We never really please God. Until the person of Jesus tears down the biggest mountain of all, which is the separating stain of sin. The Father forgives the stain of sin and all those who trusted God the Son, and so gives us the power to extend that forgiveness to others, to do something we can't naturally do on our own, which is love the people that hurt us most. So the Father forgives all of us and gives us that power to trust others, to, to, to forgive others. I grew up in a traditional liturgical church, which is full of old smells, old hymnals, old traditions. And I remember going to Sunday school. And when I went to Sunday school as a kid in that church, there was never anything heavy, never anything like solid and heavy. The, the most solid, heavy thing we got were Krispy Kreme donuts. Every Sunday I got to attend, if you've never, because you live on the West Coast, you've never had a Krispy Kreme donut. Maybe you've heard of them. They're mostly on the East Coast. Let me tell you, they are incredibly tasty up to age 30 or 40. But if you're above 30 years old, the lasting effect of a Krispy Kreme donut is a block of cylinder in your stomach if you have one. I'm serious, right? Have you ever had one? Like if you're over 30 or over 40 years old, it is like there is a brick that has been left in your stomach. It doesn't digest for like three days. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get the mechanics of it or the biology. Please don't ask me questions later. But that is all we got in Sunday school. There was nothing heavy. We talked a little about being a good person and ethics. And that's it. My folks attended within this denomination in this specific church for years. They started to become aware, oh, shoot, there is no power here. There is no lasting change that I'm getting here in this church. And they thought, well, maybe we, we can be part of that change. We can read the Bible with some other people. You know, encounter God for some change in our lives. And so they did that. And when the minister found out some people had gotten together to read the Bible, he actually rebuked them. He said, uh, you should not be doing this without me. And so my parents tried to be patient. You know, so he said they would, they, you know, he would start something up, and he did. My parents attended. What he started up was a church history class with no interaction with the Bible. So my parents started reading the Bible on their own and started attending a non-denominational church similar to ours, like PCC, actually. And they started not just to become better people, but new people. And let me tell you the truth. As a teenager, I did not like it. Like the, like, kind of like the religious leaders, I, I was okay with like some improvements, some minor tweaks and additions to their faith here and there, but not radical change. I was hostile to that. Thankfully, over time, my parents prayed for me that God would move mountains in my life, specifically the mountain that was sin, that hardened my, my stony heart against God. And those prayers were absolutely the catalyst to my trusting my life to Jesus. All because they were willing to acknowledge that they had mistakenly, for so many decades, they'd taken refuge in church going and charity giving, thinking that would right the occasional wrongs they committed in their life. They had to acknowledge it. This didn't change me. Friends, the power to be forgiven, the power to forgive others, the power forever relating to the God who withers trees to the roots and moves mountains is all possible today by trusting your life to a person, not a religious plan. God may be speaking about that directly to you this morning. And, and then to you I say, hey, if you've taken refuge in church, if you've found safety in charity, now is to the time to respond to the one who can bring about real and lasting and transformational change to your life. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to start by 
asking forgiveness for subtle ways in which um, I've taken refuge in church going and, in, and being a good person and patting myself on the back and thinking that these little rituals in my life will really bring about change. And while I trusted my life to Jesus as a teenager, I want to trust you again, Jesus, to be the one to bring about that real and lasting change. And if someone's here this morning uh, who needs to, to finally trust you for the first time, I pray that they would. I pray that they would take an honest look at their life. They'd take a look at all the evidence, whether it's the history of the Bible or the history of the 20th century or just a younger brother or sister who said no out of, <laughs> out of nowhere or the evidence from their own lives of the inability to really and truly change from the inside out. And they would look to you, Jesus, for real and lasting change, for the power to love people in a way they never thought possible and a power that can move mountains in our own life. We ask this all in your name, Jesus, and we try to trust you. Amen.